Our epistle lesson for this morning comes to us from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, beginning with verse 16. Listen to God's word. Paul writes this. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, so not to make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those who are under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this, all this, for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessing. This is the word of our God. Thanks, Thanks be, to God. be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we gather today because we long to know you, to hear your voice, feel your spirit, be strengthened by this shared meal. As we approach your scripture this morning, we pray that you will open our senses to your revelation to us so that we might draw near to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, almighty God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Paul. Paul is complicated. On one hand, the Apostle Paul is said to have penned words like, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Paul is said to have written, love is patient, love is kind. And on the other hand, in the very same letter of scripture, the one from which I've preached today, there are words that have been used by the historical and the modern church to condemn homosexuality and to keep women away from any pulpit. Paul is someone whose words have and do call us to unity. They name the best in us and our highest call to live as God's people. And Paul is someone whose words have precipitated centuries of harm. All right, now in all fairness to Paul, it is hard sometimes to figure out what it is that Paul is actually trying to say. Which of his words, um, what his intent is as he's written these words and what he's trying to say. We, we remember that Paul's words have in many ways been distorted because of things like translation and our own cultural biases that inform that. We also are reminded that Paul's words are written to a very particular context, 
to a church of people who worshiped in a city called Corinth in a particular time in history with their own needs and challenges and struggles as a people. And honestly, we are people and Paul is a person too. I know it might sound like I'm stating the obvious, but far too often we need to be reminded of that, that we gather in worship with our own needs and biases and limitations and hopes. We all get tangled up in our own limited and precise ways of thinking. We take words out of context, whether we are talking with a spouse or quoting scripture. So there is that too. When it is time to talk about Paul, it's hard to know sometimes what to do. Some feel compelled to ignore the hard parts of Paul's writings or to dismiss Paul at all altogether. I have to say there's a part of me that wouldn't blame anyone for doing just that. Paul is someone who was very, very sure of himself and his own correctness. He admittedly made many mistakes. Part of his story is his confession of that truth. Paul was self-righteous, so much so that he caused social and physical and spiritual harm to those whose beliefs were different from his own. Until he encountered Christ on a road to Damascus, and all of that changed. Sometimes I want to forget Paul, parts of Paul's writing, and honestly, there are some who think I have, as I stand here today, preaching from scripture in a pulpit at a church. I have long felt like an apologist for the gospel of Christ Jesus, though. I've felt for a long time like one who is called to continually remind others over and over that Jesus is Jesus and God is God and the Spirit is more powerful than any forces in all of humanity and that we are sinful, imperfect beings, just like Paul, trying to do our best. That God's gospel is a gospel of grace. I am called to remind myself and others that neither Paul nor myself fall outside of the circle of sinful humanity, yet we, like all who are gathered here, are called to proclaim a gospel of grace and love. And so I can't dismiss Paul. His writings are the oldest written accounts that we have of Jesus. His letters precede even the Gospels, as hard as that may be to believe. So I tend to approach his letters with caution, looking at them in the light of the larger letter in which they are found and in light of the teachings of Jesus himself. So take off your shoes, metaphorically or literally, I don't mind either way. Because anytime we approach God, we are indeed on holy ground and need to tread lightly and boldly as we move forward. Anytime I hear a word from Paul, I stop first and remind myself that Paul is not the only follower of Jesus who is complicated. Sometimes we are all so sure of our own correctness that we cause harm. Sometimes we are so unsure of what to do that the best that we can come up with is imperfect. Sometimes our judgment calls, even when grounded in love, fall short of the gospel. And sometimes our attempts to live faithfully are far from Jesus' witness to us. So I lean into Paul's words with caution for sure and with a humility that I might in fact learn from this extraordinarily imperfect follower of Jesus 
knowing that I too am an extraordinarily imperfect follower of Jesus myself. Our lection for today is not on the list of Paul's writings that have been identified as a clobber passage. They have not been categorically linked to a particular harm done in the name of Christ as others have been. But there are words in this text too that have been misapplied and misconstrued in ways that have been and could be dangerous. And so we need to face that, that the language used in this translation of this text, that Paul's description of the apostolic call to proclaim the gospel can sound in these verses like he is advocating for evangelism at any cost. At best, it can, be, it can sound like Paul is saying that one must trade authenticity for inauthenticity in order to win followers for Christ. He makes faith sound like a game show or a football game or a match of some competitive nature where Christians, souls for Jesus, are to be won and earned by his effort. But at worst, Paul's words can be misconstrued to sound like he is advocating for cultural appropriation or cultural erasure. And we must name that the church throughout history has in fact used both of these tactics in the name of Jesus, in the name of evangelism, to manipulate others into following Christ. We must repent of that. So commentators come in handy and they point out that the best way to understand Paul's intent in these seven verses is to remember that Paul's writings, Paul's little words and snippets and verses of any one text do not sit in a vacuum. The verses we have heard for today are a continuation of the writings of Paul's letter, where just a chapter earlier he was reminding the church in Corinth of their burden to accommodate those who are newer or weaker or less certain in their faith. So the context in which these verses we have heard is situated is part of a larger conversation in which Paul is talking to a people of faith about how to navigate their own inner conflict about whether or not it's okay to eat the food that has been sacrificed at the temple. Now Paul's message in chapter 8 is quite clear. It's okay to eat that meat, but if your eating of that meat will cause another to stumble or fall from their journey of faith, don't do it. Don't do anything that would cause another to stumble. Honor your siblings wherever they are in their journey of faith. Surrender your wants and your insistence on righteousness for the spiritual needs and the well-being of others. Paul is reminding the members of the church in Corinth that it's just not all about them. And so our few verses today continue this larger theme where Paul is advising the church in Corinth, a church in conflict, a church trying to navigate their respective differences, how they might be church. It's the same thing he's trying to do when he reminds the church about how to love patiently and how to work together as one body. And rather than issue a roadmap of legalisms, Paul calls upon the church to bear with one another in their differences. He advises them to let go of tightly held opinions for the sake of the larger message of the gospel of Christ's love. Paul wants, as one commentator suggests, and I quote, the Corinthians, particularly the know-it-alls who have social status, to consider their siblings in Christ and be willing to renounce their rights, their status, their privileges when necessary. It may be permissible for them to attend the banquet, but it's not beneficial to the good of the community. Another commentator writes this. For Paul, how the community orders its life 
and how members relate to each other are part and parcel of the proclamation of God's reconciliation of the world. The church is a community that God calls into existence to incarnate, live out, and proclaim this new reality. But this requires that in Christ, people find the radical freedom to identify fully with others, to become as they are, and thus to experience a genuine transformation of one's own self. The quote goes on to say that Paul clearly does not expect everyone to agree. Instead, he asked something of both groups in this, conflict, in this conflict, which he hopes will make it possible for all of them to move forward together. What he asks is that those on each side identify with those on the other side in order to become as if they were the ones with whom they disagreed. This will not involve a change in conviction, at least not at first, but it means that they are to recognize what it would mean to act on behalf of those whom they opposed. There's a story that aired on the public radio show This American Life more than 20 years ago. It was a story about two neighbors named Davy and Julie. They lived in an apartment building Davy's apartment was directly below Julie's. These two neighbors were embroiled in a conflict over the volume of Davy's music in the evening hours. When Davy's music would be played loudly, Julie would send her husband Greg downstairs to knock on the door and say, cut it out, this is driving my wife crazy. Or, Julie would take their broom and pound on the floor with a boom, 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 boom to encourage him to stop playing the music. So on this program, Davy had the fortune of meeting Mr. Rogers not once but twice in his life and so raised a question about neighborliness to our beloved Presbyterian pastor, Fred Rogers, asking Mr. Rogers what his advice would be to these two neighbors living together in conflict. Davy said, Mr. Rogers, music is such a gift. Don't I have the right to listen to my music in my house whenever I want to? Now, Mr. Rogers, being Mr. Rogers, advised Davy to put on some headphones and pointed out how both his wants and Julie's needs could be accommodated at the same time. But then Mr. Rogers went on to say this, and I quote, I have a feeling you're getting to know Julie, though, and once you know her, then either your music isn't going to bother her so much, or you're going to care about her so much that you'll probably turn it down a couple of notches anyway. Davy and Julie together said, he's right. That's exactly what happened. They're friends. At least they were friends 20 years ago when the program aired. I hope they're still friends today. Getting to know one another was a path by which Davy and Julie started to care about one another, not only about what was right, or preferred by each individual self. They became invested in the well-being of another, and they then made choices to support those needs. Brian Stevenson uses the language of being proximate in his book, Just Mercy. He says that it is by being proximate to those who suffer to those who are marginalized, to those who are poor or disenfranchised, that we together can change the world. But we need to draw near to one another. We need to get to know one another. We need to be proximate. Now, I don't need to tell all of you that here at ELPC, we strive to embody the beautiful diversity of God's kingdom, we strive to be a congregation that truly is 
radically hospitable, not just welcoming to some but to all. We have claimed at times that we are and try to be all things to all people, committed to using the resources of the church, not only our treasure but our time and our talent, to proclaim the gospel of Christ's love in as many ways and by as many means as we can use our imaginations and our time to accomplish. And as we gather here today, we are called to remember that the heart of Paul's message is not about how much we do or how busy we are in our already busy lives, but rather Paul is challenging us to a posture of heart and relationship. Our call is to be in relationship with God and with one another and with all of God's people. We are called to be proximate, to disagree but to listen, to decide but to honor the ability of another to make their own choices. Paul, surprisingly, I know, is challenging us to release our own sense of righteous indignation that can be a trap in our walk of faith so that we together might be focused on a proximate witness to the gracious love of God in Christ Jesus. For it is through relationship, by getting to know one another, by an offering of ourselves and a receiving of the whole of another, that we might be drawn near to one another and in doing so draw near to Christ so that Christ's love will be made known to all. It is this gospel that we are called to proclaim. It is a gospel of love, of welcome, of mercy, of grace, of reconciliation, of belonging. The gospel of the one who reconciled us from sin, who claimed us in baptism, who welcomes us into the family of God from wherever we are. This is the gospel of grace, of the one through whom we have inherited life and new life and eternal life. This is the gospel we proclaim as we gather around this table in just a few moments. And so, siblings, as we come forward, I invite you to look around as we share in a communion meal. As we approach the table of grace, may we hear the urging of Paul to draw near to those with whom we disagree and those we don't understand. May we draw near to the God who in Christ became proximate to us, who put on flesh and dwelt among us so that we might know the fullness of God's love for us and our call to be Christ's body in this world. May we be strengthened then to incarnate this ministry of love with sinners and outcasts and those we adore and those we can't stand, with those who put our spirits at ease and those who keep, whose thoughts and ideas keep us awake at night and push us outside of our comfort zones. Let us draw near to a Christ who is the God of all who labor on our behalf and is the God of all for whom we labor for justice and mercy and love. As we approach this communion table, may we stretch our legs, our arms, our hearts, and our minds so that we might be one with those we have identified as other, just as God in Christ became one with us. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. May we receive this good news. And may we, in our words and our deeds, share this good news with all. Friends, may it be so. Amen.